Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit as we gather together to worship this morning. We're short a few as the Clark Bickert wedding continued last night into the evening down at Elkhorn. Is that where it was? Elk, Elkwater. So we've got a few folks down there. I kind of missed Delman's entertainment. I know, surely. He had some good things planned we missed, but uh, maybe he'll tell us the stories when he gets back. Well, we are a praying people, and so we begin our services simply by that, by praying. And so I ask you to look around the room, and as the Spirit leads and guides, if you're watching us online as well, as you are led by the Spirit to pray for one another, uh, and then it's my privilege to pray for you as well. Father, thank you that we can gather in this place set aside for safety, but also a place set aside for joy, for your family to get together, a place of fellowship and assembly, a place of correction as need be, a place of encouragement as need be, a place of prayer, good food on the table, good music surrounding us, a place where you are present, as you are present in all places that we live. For there is no place that we go that does not escape your sight or the touch of your hand, and for that we are grateful. But on this, the Lord's Day, we gather together to worship in spirit and in truth, to remind it and refresh again of who you are. And so we thank you for this opportunity to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. This week is Holy Week as we move into the week. It's kind of a full week on the church calendar. Uh, and as a consequence, there won't be any Bible study on Wednesday night. But if you move through... Thursday night, we start off with the Last Supper. So it kind of goes through a season of following Jesus' life. Thursday night was the night he gathered with his disciples, and they shared the Last Supper. Tradition that's called Green Thursday or Monday Thursday. Monday Thursday confuses people. We're just going to call it Holy Thursday. And so as we gather, we're going to do a bit of a journey through the book of Mark as we go around the church and experience in a small way uh, some of the events of that, last, of that last evening together. And then... Friday morning, we gather together for what's called Good Friday, and I know it's the day of the death of Christ, and people say, hmm, how is that good? Um, but it's the good news of great joy, which we proclaim. And so that'll be here at 11, and that service is a bit uh, more somber. If you grew up in Lutheran traditions, perhaps, you remember that was the season they took all the decorations out of the church and draped everything in black crepe. Uh, we're not going to do that, but that's a bit more of a somber service. And then Saturday is the day of Christ in the tomb, where the church traditionally does nothing. It's considered a day of rest, a Sabbath. Uh, and so it's a quiet day. And then Sunday morning, we will meet at the Millennium Gardens at 9 a.m. for Resurrection Sunday with the other churches in town to re read the story and sing a little bit. And then back here for breakfast. Because what else would you do as you gather together as a family? You eat breakfast. And that's a potluck breakfast, right? So bring your breakfast best. Uh, Dylan's not here, so I can't make fun of men's breakfast, but um, bring your breakfast best, and then we will be celebrating Resurrection morning together here on Sunday. So that is there in your notes. But I assume Club DJ is still on the go and Ladies Bible Study on Tuesday. Um, all right, if you have any questions, it should be there in front of you. I do want to congratulate our men's hockey team on their two and two. It was good. Um, I see a lot of people that normally don't limp when they come to church, maybe a limping a little more. But in particular, I want a big shout out to Alex the Wall Hut, who kept us in the game. <laughs> Does every goalie get 100 shots on net in one game? Is that the norm for... I don't remember. <laughs> Just a blur of black rubber flying at him. So anyhow, thanks guys, you represented us well. And we appreciate uh, the, the team. So. All right, and then you'll see April is 6, coming up very quickly, and that is Church Cleaning Day. Donna, anything you want to mention? Um, no, just come if you can, and find a job, and we'll get her done. You betcha, get the place freshened up for spring, and then ladies retreat there on the 13th as well. All right, have I missed anything? It is today, the first Sunday, it is Palm Sunday, and so we begin, Keith. We don't always think about what 
we're saying when we get up here and say stand us with if you're able because some of us this morning are not as able as we'd like to be so Jordy if you don't want to stand I understand <laughs> we have Palm Sunday this morning we've got a wonderful group of children out in the foyer that are going to help us to get into the spirit of the triumphal entry this morning so I will I will ask you to stay seated so that you can see but sing loud because we are celebrating the entry of our Savior into Jerusalem this morning. Dan, your mic is still on. You got it. Got it. Thanks, guys. disciples telling them go into the village ahead of you at once you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her untie them and bring them to me if anyone says anything to you you should say that the Lord needs them and immediately he will send them this took place so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled tell daughter Zion look your king is coming to you gentle and mounted on a donkey even on a colt the foal of a beast of burden the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them they brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their robes on him, and he sat on them. A very large crowd, large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them on the road as well. And the Lord went ahead of them, and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. He who comes in the name of the Lord is the Blessed One. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Oh. 
Please bow with me. Father, we enter into this season, perhaps Holy Week doesn't always catch our attention as much as Christmas. A lot of the lights and the bells and the whistles that go with it are not always before it. But as we enter this week, we reflect on a gift beyond measure, beyond imagination. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were yet running, you pursued us. While we were yet far off, you looked for us. While we were in the dark, he lit the lamp and found us there on the floor. And for that, we are grateful. So as we move into the season of this week, I pray that you would ever draw our hearts every day towards you. As we celebrate the promise being fulfilled, that the one who was promised for centuries has come and life has come. Father, we pray for those who are entering a season of surgery. We know that we've got several folks who are finally have hospital dates and others who are in the process of recovery. And we ask that that great lamb would pour life into them. We thank you for our men's team. As we go out, we enjoy the gift of life and of strength and of a place in our community. I thank you for them. Father, thank you for the seeds to come up. We pray for those who are calving and getting ready and thinking about seeding, getting equipment and seed cleaned. All the work that goes involved with that, 
that you would be gracious and strengthen them. Father, we thank you for every good and precious gift this day. And now as we take up this offering, we do it as an act of love, as an act of worship, always with joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll ask our ushers to come forward. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like calming storms and even raised people from the dead. At this time, the Jewish people were celebrating a festival called Passover that had been celebrated since the time of Moses when God brought his people out of Egypt. So Jesus was going to Jerusalem to celebrate. Jesus and his disciples stopped in the town and Jesus told two of his disciples to go on ahead of them. Okay. He told them to go into a village and that they would see a young donkey that no one had ever ridden. He told them to untie it and bring it to him. If anyone asks, what are you doing? He told them to just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. So the disciples did what Jesus said and brought him the donkey. A long time ago, before Jesus was even born, God had said that the Savior, the King of Israel, would come to Israel in this way. And now Jesus was doing just as God had said. The news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem swept through the city. Many heard about all the amazing things he had done. So they cut palm branches and ran to see him. The Pharisees and religious rulers realized that there was nothing they could do for everyone was going to see Jesus. Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem and the crowd spread their coats on the road ahead of him. His followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. The Pharisees were upset. Hey, Jesus! And they told Jesus to stop the people from saying things like that. But Jesus said, if they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. So the people kept on singing, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered, asking, who is this? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus. And Jesus rode the donkey through the street of Jerusalem to the temple in a triumphal entry just as God said he would many years before. Stand with us as we continue to worship this morning. The Lord who is triumphantly coming to our life.
And you may notice a theme here this morning, but there's a lot of hosannas going on today, and another one of the hosanna songs that we love to sing on Palm Sunday.
cheering section at the three on three tournament. Yeah. Who was there by the way at the three on three tournament? Good. All right, that cheering section. Can I hear your cheer? Okay, that was good. One more time. One more time. Well, same thing. We'll give it another try. Everybody else join them. And that's for a hockey game. I went to a Swift Current hockey game one time and you know what the fans in Swift Current do? They just sit on their hands. They're terrible. Can you imagine if Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who raised people from the dead, who brought good news, who was coming again, came? You know what they did? They went, Ooh. No, they, they took their branches down and they took their coats off and they cheered and they sang Hosanna, Hosanna. And so we're going to sing one of my all time favorite songs, Jumping Up and Down. I became a pastor so I didn't have to sit still in church. That way I could always walk around. And that's my advantage, because when I was in school, they used to make me sit on my hands, because I was so fidgety, just like some other people I might know. <laughs> that, uh... So, we're going to stand, and we're going to say, uh, do we start with the chorus? Yes, yes. we do. All right, so stand up with me. The rest of you join me. Feel free to be young. Jump up and down. I know we're not a Pentecostal church, but Mennonites, just let it go for a minute. Just, just, just <laughs> surrender, surrender to the joy. You don't have to jump too high, because I always run out of breath. So we start with... And what do we do when it says jumping up and down? Jumping up and down, jumping up and down, jumping up and down, shout Hosanna, Hosanna!
Father, joy captivates us. Sorrow carries us, and your word sustains us. So this morning, whether we are experiencing sorrow or joy, your word is sufficient to sustain us and to give us all that we need for life and godliness, and we are grateful for that, so that we may be fully equipped, lacking nothing, perfect in every good word and deed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the years, it has been uh, our privilege as a family to serve in a handful of churches, but also to attend a lot of churches growing up, all these ministries. And this is not uh, exaggeration nor smoke, but I have never been in a community of people who more loved to build, to craft, to, to create, people who spend more time making and creating. This place is a place that builds businesses, farms, and homes, coaches who build new players, farmers and ranchers who are always building something, yards, fences, bins, buildings, calves, chickens, horses, cats, and dogs, and whatever else you're raising these days, painters, seamstresses, house renovators, aircraft mechanics, gunsmiths, diesel mechanics, welders, body men, body builders, musicians, writers, counselors, canners, quilters, puzzlers, cooks, gardens, needle pointers, bookkeepers, and plumbers, Others of you build our safe communities. You keep on build healthy minds and bodies. And I apologize if I missed anybody. Oh, I forgot to mention the babies. Right. <laughs> we build. It seems that everywhere I go and everyone I meet is either crafting, creating, or renewing. I don't know if it's something in the water or the wind in this place that has produced you. It's as if when you were a child, Someone gave you a set of tools and said, go, have fun with them. And they forgot to call you back in after supper. <laughs> and you've been at it ever since. In the face of drought, disease, wind, inflation, infection, sickness, loss, sorrow, and grief, you just keep building. And to be honest, it's hard to keep up with you sometimes. And on top of all of that, you have built a community in a place where the wind tries to blow everything down and the cold freezes everything up. You have built where nothing should be built. And if you look on our church Facebook page this week, you will see a picture of Leader or Prussia in 1913. And you will see where all the barns are and how little was there. But I think I know why. I think I know why you are builders because that mindset that heart set to keep building despite how hard it might be is at the heart of God see God creates saves builds no matter how hard it is no matter how cold the wind or hard the soil he's a builder to put Jesus into a prairie context, and I, this is not cursing, this is quoting him directly, I will build my church and the winds of hell will not overpower it. Jesus is a builder. To build in the face of difficulty and opposition. To build on a land where nothing should be built. You see, that's God's heart, the builder. And so the book of Jude confronts the issue of a growth, a ministry, a church that was growing. They were building an opposition. Wind came in to try and destroy it. And this is Jude's instruction in this last little part on how to build. This is Jude's three commands. Remember, keep and save. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 17. We'll give you a moment there. Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 17, this morning we look at a blueprint for builders. Jude chapter 1, starting in verse 17. There's not a lot of verses there, so we'll read it as we go. This is the last section of Jude. And in this section, he gives five commands. Now, we know that voice has command. If you say to your dog, come here, or your kid, come here, depends on how you speak. I remember one time when Mark was lost in Superstore, we were yelling, come here. It wasn't like, oh, sweetie. It was like, get over here now. That's the imperative 
voice. It's the voice of command. And so Jude uses five imperatives. It is the voice of authority. It is leave him alone. Stand down. Come here. Stop. That's the tone here. Like a shop teacher or a job foreman now giving clear commands to his workmen. Here's how to build. So here we find these five commands on how to build a church in the face of destruction that was brought about by the false teachers we looked at last week. So five commands. Remember, keep, have mercy, save, and show mercy. Don't worry, we'll revisit them several times. And these five commands are really given in three stages. The first stage is the first command, the second stage is the second, and the last three are grouped together under the third section. So three stages containing five commands. In the first stage, Jude calls us to be aware of the environment we're building in. You know that above all people, that the environment you're building in determines the outcome in many ways. And so the first command is this, dress for the weather. That's verse 17 tonight. The second command is the actual set of instructions on how to build, and we'll call this pick up your tools, and that's verses 20 and 21. And the third section is what to do with the broken or leftover pieces. We'll call that don't throw anything out. That's chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. So let's look at the first command. Then. Dress for the weather. Verses 17 and 19. But you, beloved, ought to remember. There's the command. That's the imperative. You ought to remember. The words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last times there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. That's the opening command that's all rooted or based around that imperative command. And he calls the church to remember. Remember last week we saw the situation in the church that was being destroyed, torn apart by these false teachers. Like the old wolf in the story, they were huffing and puffing and trying to blow the house down. And Jude says, look, when it comes to the church, false teachers always have been, always will be, you knew it was coming. And so he tells the church, commands the church, remember. Remember what the apostles told us, spoken beforehand by the apostles. He's quoting 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Know this, that first of all, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts. He says, remember we knew this hard times were coming. He predicted, he had a good weather model, so to speak. And then he says, remember how to spot them. Here's how you can tell this opposition, who these markers are. He gives a set of descriptions so that we can know when it's happening and who's doing it. He says, they'll be mockers. This is a great word. It means to play as a child, to make fun of, or to, we would say, you know, not know the gravity and the true weight of what they're doing. And so these people we saw last week, they, they deal lightly with spiritual things. They don't take them seriously. They play fast and loose in the realm of the spirit. And he says, secondly, you'll know who they are because they follow their own lusts. And we saw that last week, but look who their master is, who they're following after. Rather than following after what is good and right and pure and true and just, that which we are called to, they follow their own desires. Philippians 3.19 says, their God is their belly. I love this. It reminds me of a dog. You, know, you think about a dog whose God is his belly, who just eats and eats and then throws up and then eats again. Right? They're driven by that constant appetite. And he says, these people are not driven by the higher things of good and God. They're driven by their own lusts. And their God is their worship of their own belly. It's a great picture. So remember, we saw them coming, that they are childish that they're mockers, and that they are driven by their own lusts. Remember, the results are always the same. Division, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. It's as if Jude got up, looked at the long-range forecast, and knew that to build anything on the prairies, it's always going to be windy. I really wish Doug was here this morning. It's always going to be windy. There will always be opposition to the work of God, not only in the, in the body of Christ, but also in our own lives. We said that before, as we take spiritual steps forward. You, know, you ever play whack-a-mole at the fair? You know that game with the thing, and boop, 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 you hit it? Whenever we take steps forward, whether it's baptism or obedience or repentance, we stick our head up and Satan just loves to play whack-a-mole with us, you know? We find ourselves in opposition. It's always going to be windy. And you can spot the wind at a distance. 
There'll always be signs that the weather's about to change. For wind does what wind does. It divides. It whirls around. It seems devoid of purpose. Remember the little boy who said, you know, I know where wind comes from. Those big white things that spin around, that's making the wind. It's pushing it your way. Or else, where was it? Bonnie, was it your grandson who said the wind came from the trees? Uh, maybe not. Somebody else's grandson said, I know where the wind comes. The trees make the wind. But no. Wind seems devoid of purpose. It sucks the life out of the soil. And driven by chaos, it mocks our feeble attempts to put up a sheet of plywood. Wind opposition will face the church. We're always building in the wind. The church will always be faced with opposition and difficulties, and sadly, all too often from within. So, so the forecast. Second command is found in verses 20 and 21. Pick up your tools. Here the imperative, or the command, is the word keep. Let's read 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Did you see it there? Tucked in the middle? That little section is surrounded by the command, keep. And there are three words, three other commands, sort of commands, they're participles if you're an English major, that surround the imperative command. At the heart of this command is keep yourself in the love of God as you do these other things. It's the primary idea. This is how a soul or a community or a life or a church is built in love. How do you build in bad weather? Well, sometimes you'll put up a, something to block the wind, right? A, maybe a fence or a shroud, or as we say in industry, you hoard it in, right? That's that, help me out here. That's that big plastic they put around buildings so that they can then build in safety. In here is called a locative phrase. It means the location. It means the place where we do the building and the praying and the waiting are contained within something. He's quoting almost directly Jesus in John 15. Just as the Father has loved me, I also love you. Abide, dwell, hoard yourself, as it were, in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide, dwell, live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands, and abide, dwell. So it's, it's this atmosphere that we build around so that we can build good things within. In the love of God is where all things in the church occur. It literally translates within the sphere of God's love. Let love be the atmosphere in which you breathe, in which you build inside, thereby keeping the winds of opposition, for love will shelter you from the winds of opposition. It will also make those other people very uncomfortable and want to leave that atmosphere. It's like when you pour, you built that great plastic shell against the elements, creating a healthy and safe and warm environment in which we can build. It is the fence around the feedlot, the wire around the chickens. It keeps the coyotes at bay. It allows for safety and growth. And this is, of course, contrasted to the inn that the false teachers had, who did everything in the love of pleasure and selfishness. So he's setting up contrast. Someone wrote this, a community kept in the love of God will not love power. It will love what God loves in the way that God loves. And herein is love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us and gave his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. So, how do we keep ourselves in the love of God? What are we building while well, surrounded by this great love? He gives us three tools. Here are our three little words. Verse 20, by building yourself up in the faith. He says, in your most holy faith. Well, what's he talking about? This faith that was handed down from the apostles, from Jesus, on and on. This idea here presented is that it is the knowledge of the Word, the knowledge of Jesus' teaching. This is what the Spirit would do. He would lead us and guide us into all things that we have been taught. This is what we're supposed to do as a church, to make disciples teaching them whatsoever I commanded you. We are to learn cognitively the truth. You see, if you love something, you learn about it. So what do you do? You read, you go to trade shows, you go to conferences, you spend time with like-minded people, you ask them questions, you hunger and learn to learn to know more so that you can enjoy it more. We grow in grace 
That's the ability to do, and knowledge, the ability of. Grace and knowledge. Grace is the ability to do these things graciously. Knowledge is the knowledge about these things. This is done through study and community and asking good questions. Let's say, for example, you decide to take up golf. You've never golfed before. What do you do? Well, you might start reading golf magazines. I suppose they still make them. You might go online and watch golf videos, and then you go out and you talk to Wes, who loves to golf. You say, tell me about golf, tell me why you want golf. I have a friend, there's a famous picture of Tiger Woods on the cover of Time Magazine, and he's doing something, I don't know, something special. And in the picture, you can see Brady. He's right there. Brady loves golf. So I said, tell me about golf. It's a two hour lecture, I'll tell you. But what you do is you spend, and then you go and you buy your clubs and you practice and you take lessons and you become absorbed in golf. So you can get better and not be so frustrated at the game. We do this constantly with things. Videos and people. It is a mastery we strive for. And so too, we love the truth. We love the gospel. We love the good news. And so what do we do? We study. We have Wednesday night Bible study and Sunday school and youth group and a library. And we go online and we watch videos because we want it. And then we start living it out. We start saying this, I enjoy this. I, I start to love this life that gives joy and peace and purpose and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and diligence out here. Self-control. This is mastery. Second, verse 20. By praying in the Holy Spirit, he says, pray in the Holy Spirit. We move now from more of a cognitive idea to a more mystical idea. By the way, this is the only occurrence of this phrase in the entire New Testament. No one's really sure what he exactly means. The meaning is uncertain. It may be simply worshiping God as we are led by the Spirit, rather than listening to the false prophets. As we gather together, we pray that the Spirit would work through our musicians, the songs they pick the week before as they prepare as I prepared, that we would be led by the Spirit, that we would pray in the Spirit when we gather on Wednesday nights. Romans 8, 26 says this, in the same way the Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we don't know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And so we're praying for a friend and we don't know what to say. We just go, be with them. And the Spirit takes that prayer and he magnifies it and he amplifies it and he, with great groaning, he prays. We know that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father. Don't worry about your words too much. Don't worry if they bounce off the ceiling. God doesn't live in the attic. We pray. Some have commented this. We pray in the Spirit by continual dependence on the Spirit. Lord, I know my prayers are, are weak. May the Spirit empower them. By continually being filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be continually filled with the Spirit, we pray. Oh Lord, every day fill me afresh with your Spirit. By continually being controlled by the Spirit, walking hand in hand and saying, Lord, I want to walk with the Spirit today. And so Jude calls us to build this mystical community with spiritual tools for spiritual truths have spiritual power in the spiritual place. Where the Word is mastery, the spirit is mystery. We build with mastery and we surrender to the mystery. I, I don't understand. And thirdly, verse 21, looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Here's the word, wait anxiously. Remember Christmas Eve? That stomach feeling when you were a kid? <laughs> My dad used to work shift work and he would come home late, three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock and then one day he came home like eight. so we waited all christmas day until seven o'clock and what did my dad do when he walked in i need supper we wait anxious for his arrival a deliberate the phrase here is literally put out the welcome mat our future hope unlike the false teachers who are only looking for their immediate needs the church always keeps one eye in the distance in the future we're building knowing that the master is coming home. As Gordy Sparks told me, there's no such thing as good enough. There's only good or not. If it's good, we build knowing that the master is coming and we're building for him. So whether we eat or whether we drink, whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. Whether you're fixing an airplane, welding, cleaning up corrals, I don't know what you're doing, Keith. I don't know what you do. But, uh, whatever we're doing, we do it in light of the master's return. That's our vision. The master keeps in sight. So there is mastery to strive for. There is mystery to surrender. 
and there is a master to keep in sight. Let's sum up this second section. So in the face of winds of opposition, false teachers, and difficulties in the church, the church builds. Surrounded by the love of God, which shelters her from the worst of the elements, she is the master of the sharp blade of the word, understanding and experienced in its power. Yet she surrenders to the mystery of the power of the Spirit and prayer. And then she measures all that she has done in the knowledge of the coming of the Master, anticipating his return, waiting for the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. She presents to him the beauty of the bride, unstained and unspoiled. When you were building this church, that you were building beauty for the Master. It's interesting. Buckminster Fuller, who was the father of the geodesic dome, said, I never build with beauty in mind. But when I'm done, if it's not beautiful, I've done it wrong. Beauty becomes a part of it for the master's purpose. Now, the church, unspoiled? I've been to a lot of churches. The church seems pretty spoiled sometimes. False teachers, divisions, controversies. And so Jude says, what about those controversies? What about the fallen people? What about those who were swayed by false teachings and heresy? Do we just discard them? What do we do with the spoils and the wounded? Sadly, it's been said too many times that the church is the only organization that you know, shoots her own wounded. That's not the command of scripture, nor the life of the church. What do you do with the leftover pieces? Now, some of us collect the leftover pieces. I love when Danny does work, because then I get leftover pieces. And I think, what can I do with these? Donna's mom left us jars of screws and bolts. I have used most of them. I love it. You know, what do we do with, when you're done the project, with the leftover? Some of it you might throw in the burning barrel. Others just think, I know, someday I'll use that. And I suspect many of you have a pile of pieces, thinking, someday I'll use that part. And you will. So the command is third. Third command. Don't throw anything out. Verses 22 and 23. Have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Let's look at these three kinds of people represented here. For Jude now begins to deal with the people who had fallen sway to the false teachers, or the false teachers themselves, those who had been led astray. What do we do with them? He addresses what to do in three categories. He said, first, there are some who doubt. They come to church, and I suspect all of us at some point have had doubts. We hear a preacher say something, we read a verse, we go, uh, I don't know, I, I have my doubts. Does that mean I can't come to church? Does that mean I'm, I'm losing my faith? What do we do? And to be honest, we all have doubts. He said, some who follow the false teachers, they actually went so far as to, to encamp with them. And thirdly, the false teachers themselves. Now, if you're a Bible study person, by the way, this passage is extraordinarily complex. Um, there are at least six different texts that we translate to this, but that's neither here nor there. First off, have mercy on some who are doubting. How do we deal with people who doubt? Well, Jude is very clear. Those who were wavering under the influence of the false teacher should never be rejected or ignored. They should always be given mercy. What in Bible study Romans tell us? That God is a God of mercy. This is how we are to treat those who are confused by different teaching and have followed different ways and they come and say, I just don't know, I'm confused. We show mercy. As they struggle with their doubts, we reclaim them and walk with them. The church never rejects those who are doubting, but always is merciful. Doubters deserve compassion. Secondly, save. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. Others were close to being captured by the false teachers and, and the behavior of their opponents. These believers, we must not quit on them. We must always endure. Their lives can be salvaged. They could be snatched as if from the fire of heresy and brought back to a true and living faith. Those who have gotten deeper need rescue. We work and remain with them. Mercy, salvation. Fanny Crosby wrote this, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Weep over the erring ones, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus who is mighty to save. Fanny never said cut them off cold and reject them. She said, weep, lift, snatch, 
care for them. And then Jude turns the tables on the false teachers, for they were only looking out for themselves. <laughs> Jude tells the church to look out for them and to give mercy. And lastly, these false teachers themselves. What do you do with people who come into the church and produce false teaching? There's lots of more detail in scripture that fleshes this out. But for here, for this passage, he asks, do they deserve to be thrown out of the church? He says, no, no, give people opportunity. To the doubting, be patient and merciful. To those who are convinced, work with them. Listen, ask, lead, do all you can to pull them out of the fire. And to those who oppose you, he says, carefully, Fearfully, mercifully, work with them as people but reject their teachings. And he says, and on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. These declared disciples of apostasy are to be handled with caution just in case we too would be swayed by their charismatic nature. But he says a neat little phrase here. Hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Would you like the literal translation of that this morning? Yeah. I'll get as close as I can with kids present. The garment, the word here, refers to your underwear, which is pictured here as stained and soiled. Just as no one wants to handle someone else's dirty underwear, he says, too, that's what you're dealing with here. And this is where the idea of hating the sin and not the sinner comes from. Maybe you've heard that phrase, well, hate the sin and love the sinner. Yes, that's from Jude, where he says, loving them, but hating the garment that has been defiled by the flesh. I love what John MacArthur said. You love the baby, not the diaper. And that's what he's talking about. Some false teachers are soiled and polluted right down to the core, the essence, which is engaging them in their skin, so to speak. And he says, for them, you show mercy. Even your most dreaded opponents deserve mercy. All right, let's sum this up and draw this to a conclusion. You know that when you're building, you don't throw stuff away just because it doesn't fit right now. You see the value of those pieces. And you see the purpose that remains with them. And perhaps if you're a really good carpenter and contractor, you could incorporate some of those pieces back into the original design. You never overlook the seemingly useless parts. Beloved, the church will always face opposition, always face confusion, always seeming to live in contradiction. It's the nature of we who we are. We will always be building in the wind. So how do we do that? First, we shroud the church in love. This changes the atmosphere of the church. It adds warmth. It allows for work to be done. We love the work and we work in love. Now, when I'm talking about love here, I'm not talking about country music love. You know, you know the country songs that we hear on the radio now? It goes like this. It goes, dirt road, old truck, girlfriend, dog, mama cry, Friday night, tailgate, mama, dog. That's, that's pretty much country music where we're at today. That's not what I'm talking about. Talk about biblical love, which is love that gives so that another might grow. By the way, there's country rap, if you can get your head around that. that uh, I want you to think about your workplace for a moment, whether it's your farm or your home. Or, think about what shroud, shrouds or surrounds it. What's the atmosphere of that place? It may be a place of joy you get the privilege of working in, but you also know that there are some pretty toxic workplaces. It may be a place of sacrifice or, or of want or need or anger. You can feel when you go into a business or, or into a home that there's a, a shroud, a horde, an atmosphere that surrounds it, especially if there's been loss or death. You can just, it's palpable when you walk in that there can be a home and a family in grief. You go to an anniversary yesterday at the wedding. Man, they were happy. It was like the whole thing was just in love. I love what the photographer did. She said, I want that wedding kiss really good. You gotta count three Mississippis. And he said, four. And uh, so I stepped that away. You could see him just before they kissed, he went. <laughs> the whole day was in joy, in love. The church is shrouded in self-sacrificing, giving love. That's the place we work in. 
Then we master the words, dedicating ourselves to it. That's our strength. We surrender to the spirit, mystery. That's our humility. We don't know. And then we survey the horizon, always looking for Jesus. That's our hope. So the church builds strength, humility, and hope. And we never discard someone. Even those who are seeking to harm, undermine, and undo. And yes, there are times that, as we work through and warn, there are times that we must cut ties with people. And we have seen that happen. But be at peace as long as it's up to us. And I'm not being naive enough. I've been pastoring for 35 years. There are times it's brutal and painful. But the goal is to restore even those who seek to harm the church. Even those who seek to divide the church, we show mercy. To those who doubt, we are merciful. To those who are carried away, we fight to keep them. And to those who are opposed, we love them despite the smell. We never give up. We never give up on learning. We never stop surrendering. We never stop looking. We never stop praying. We never stop loving. We never give up on love. For Christianity is one great romance. And I'll conclude with this story, for it's one of my favorites. The great American statesman and lawyer, Willings Jennings Bryant, was having his personal portrait painted back in the day before photographs were so common. And the artist said to him, why do you wear your hair long, well past your ears? Bryant said, there's a story there. He said, there's a romance there. When I began courting Mrs. Bryant, she objected to the way my ears stood out. So to please her, I grew my hair to cover her ears. And he said, that was many years ago. Why don't you cut your hair now? And Bryant said, ah, the romance is still going on. No matter how. Beloved, the church. Jesus loves the church, and the romance never ends. That's pretty. Father, we are called to be fierce warriors and defenders of the truth on the open. We are called to take a stand in opposition against that which is destructive. We are called to surrender to the remarkable and often ununderstandable work of the Spirit beyond us. We are called to be faithful. Father, may this church be shrouded in love and all we do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Keep. We're going to close off this morning with uh, number 33 in your hymnal. If you want to follow along in the hymnal, work up here. Stand with us as we sing, How Great Thou Art. Good chance to turn there if you'd like to follow. How Great Thou Art.
but we begin Holy Week on Thursday here at 7, and you're all invited to join us this morning for coffee. And now may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ through his vicarious death on the cross for all your sins. God bless.